I think the best means of rebutting the contingency argument as a cosmological argument for God's existence is to say that um, well, things in nature aren't necessarily contingent at all. Um, contingency implies that something in nature um, from a certain set of initial conditions will continue to be the same thing in the future and forever and ever and so on and always has been the same in the past as well. For instance, so you can take the contingency argument like why does this vape um, have contingency in time and space? Why does it persist in time and space as an individuated, unique object? Um, for instance, well, this has been made by human beings. It was designed by human artifice in the first place. It was manufactured in a factory and so on and so forth. So we could take from that kind of contingency argument that the factory and the human beings from the perspective of, I don't know, an ant or something might... Um, consider this vape to be some sort of godlike creation or a, or a creation of a being of far greater intelligence than the ant for instance an ant might stumble would stumble upon this of course and have no idea what it is no idea what it signifies no idea what its function is it could you know crawl upon it inspect it but not really be able to um, explain its existence however we as its as its artificers as creators are able to explain its existence and its whole process of creation. However, what what this will do, just in, in much the same way as what will happen to the universe eventually, or elements of the universe, or parts of the universe, so that this will eventually break. Um, it will. Is this is a uh, this is a re non reusable vape, so it will eventually um, run out, and I have to throw it away. It will be chucked in the recycling, I hope, and um, it will be turned. It's its components will be harvested and turned into different things, perhaps yet more vapes, right? So that's one element on which it doesn't have contingency. There's the idealist perspective on why it does have contingency. Also, I grant you it has contingency for a certain period of time and space. Uh, well, you know, um, it, it interacts constantly with the particles around it. And this is something that in quantum mechanics we refer to as decoherence. We live in a decoherent universe so that this vape exists as a, as a measurable, definable, weighable, you know, classical object in space that obeys the classical laws of physics. It obeys Newtonian gravity. It's subject to the laws of uh, general relativity and so on and these sorts of things. It obeys the laws of physics, right? But um, if we were to store this in a hermetically sealed container for trillions upon trillions of years, it would eventually evaporate away via Hawking radiation. It would, it would eventually crumble and turn into nothing. Um, and that process would be driven ultimately by um, entropy, the, the second law of thermodynamics, which um, you know implies the transience of all things. And this is one of the great things that um, Eastern sages have picked up on greatly throughout history, that, that that far from being the contingency of objects in nature, that um, you know, individuated objects and things in nature and the universe itself indeed, that will, will eventually come to nothing. I'm not such a big believer actually in the heat death argument of the universe. Um, I, I believe that there will be a recombination process of matter and energy and that um, a big crunch will happen. That's my personal cosmo cosmology. But um, I believe that prior to the Big Bang, pro rather than being a, a god in the way that a lot of us would describe a god, a deist or a theist god prior to the creation, what I believe about the Big Bang is that there had been a period of... of of great expansion driven by dark energy in the universe that preceded this one that's eventually it's it spent all its energy the, the stars ran out of energy and so on um, again driven by by entropy driven by the second law of thermodynamics this tendency for, for all disorder to increase in nature rather than rather than to decrease and all its energy was eventually spent all the, the energy was filling up the galaxy clusters or the gaps between the galaxy clusters, I should say, of that previous universe, and eventually under gravity it started to collapse again into into a big crunch, and thence into a big bang again, driven by inertial processes, driven by elastic scattering processes, ultimately, of matter and energy. Um, 
that recombine, you know, in, uh, firstly in, to, into, into protons and um, thence eventually after uh, 400,000 years or so um, into, into atoms. And we have the epoch of nucleosynthesis in the very early universe and that releases the cosmic microwave background and um, we then start to get the formations of stars. The first stars start coming light and start burning. So, I mean, what what I would be accused of, I would be accused of ultimately of a circular argument <laughs> and it's a circular argument. But then again, what is wrong with a circular argument? If you on, on this sort of level and in this sort of thing, like what, what circularity in arguments? Like, we're circling around yet yeah, on the same point. We're trying to describe cyclical processes of expansion and contraction. So, I mean, is it so much a circular argument as it, as opposed to being like a mechanical argument of some description? I, I breathe in and out, you know, waves slosh up and down beaches. I mean, this is, it, it's not so much a circular argument as it is like, like a, a wave-like argument, possibly in my mind. Um, and yeah, we're not, we're not do, doing what people typically consider a circular argument um, but it does return upon the same point and it is a, it is a circular process if you like it, um, it, you know, it goes around from from one point to another and again and around 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 it's cyclical you see like like um, the rotations of planets and stars like um, the seasons you know we uh, we go from winter through spring, summer, autumn, back to winter again. It seems a very naturalistic, holistic way of explaining things. And that, um, that comes out of my pantheism, I think. So for uh, having a, a sufficient reason or um, a necessary and sufficient reason to explain everything, I don't think that you need this ultimate creator at the end of this infinite recess. I think that you can have an, a universe that's infinite in temporal and spatial extent, possibly, and that really, when when we see the Big Bang, with you know, with our telescopes and our, our mappings of the cosmic microwave background and so on, what we're really seeing is um, ju just one small part of the far larger totality, more than likely, I think, um, just it, it, it expanding and contracting. And we live upon this infinite, let's say, plenum, and why not, let's say it's infinite plenum of matter and energy that um, in localised regions of it expands and contracts over vast periods of time. And in temporal extent, it is infinite also. And we say that God is infinite because God is the universe. God would at least have to be like partly the universe if he she or they <laughs> were anything at all and um yeah that's um that's my that's my approach to pr the principle of sufficient reason inspired by this alex o'connor very good um uh, discussion debates about what the best arguments for the existence of god are with um ryan schmidt is his name that's another youtube channel about this sort of thing but yeah very good discussion about the best arguments for the existence of God. This is um, my approach to the cosmological argument, the contingency argument. Um, I think this was the argument proposed by Leibniz in its modern iteration anyway. Um, yeah, I've gone too far down the physics rabbit hole I've sort of neglected my knowledge of philosophy <laughs> and uh, reasoning about the existence of God and so on but it's a, yeah, a fascinating question it's a fascinating argument um, it's, it's one that is possible to undermine however and the way that you know you go about undermining the contingency argument um, what's a necessary and sufficient reason for the contingency of all things in nature like, well, things aren't contingent in nature. That's that's the basis of it. It's a fundamental fact about nature that things actually, they're, they're not contingent as such. They are transient. They are, they are they, they're nat it is within the nature of all things to decay via entropy, via the second law of thermodynamics, to for disorder within the universe to increase. Though um, we, we, 
we find within the universe, of course, such as um, epochs with our, with our planets around the sun that um, are, are very stable and harmonious by comparison to what far faster entropic processes would entail, such as uh, supernovae and so on. But nonetheless, the sun, the sun is always losing mass and energy. Mass is energy relativity sort of yeah it is but um you know it's it's always it's always ejecting material of course so um it, it's inevitably going to die a star and it'll be replaced by other stars the same will happen to the rest of the stars in the galaxy and the rest of the universe and so on and this is this is the world we're living in this is the universe we're living in and um is a beautiful, remarkable place. Yeah, of staggering beauty and wonderful complexity and <clears throat> great profundity, obviously. And um, but nonetheless, transient, doomed, and um, decaying constantly. So that'd be my. Uh, thoughts on the contingency argument and the cosmological argument for God's existence.